This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. In terms of the numbers of people involved, the gravity of the crimes committed, and their impact, it is clear that the persecution of Christians is today worse than at any time in history. Not only are Christians more persecuted than any other faith group, but ever-increasing numbers are experiencing the very worst forms of persecution. All right, guys, that is a line from the subject matter for today's podcast, and that is from the executive summary of this report called Persecuted and Forgotten, a report on Christians oppressed for their faith 2015 through 2017. So this report was put together by an organization called Aid to the Church in Need, or ACN for short. Um, Aid to the Church in Need, uh, it's basically a a Catholic charity. It's a papal charity. Um, It supports Catholic people and other Christians that are persecuted and oppressed around the world, uh, or those that are just basic in need of basic pastoral care. And so if you go to their website, they have some objectives here. So I just wanted to read these verbatim from their website. So if you go to their website, it says this, these are their objectives to support and promote the church. That's the Catholic church, especially in countries where Christians are suffering persecution or discrimination to further the other charitable work of the church by providing practical assistance and pastoral care for persons in need, especially those who are living in or are refugees from such countries. In addition to that, they can and do in large part provide emergency and pastoral relief in 140 countries around the globe. And also they're committed to chronicling and assessing the cases and the trends uh, of Christian persecution and oppression around the world. And so this is an organization that has kept up with this for a very long time. They didn't just start this back in 2015. They have some older reports, but these are the most recent. So uh, most of you may have heard of this report from a Newsweek article. So this was a Newsweek article that came out in January of 2018, so the beginning of this year. And it was something that was pretty egregious and pretty crazy whenever you saw it, like at face value. But the other thing that was pretty egregious about it is that we didn't really hear that much about it. It wasn't really a story that made national and certainly not really international headlines like it should have. I mean, there's it's national news when Trump tweets something off color about somebody, which he shouldn't be doing, but it's that's national news. That's something that we need every single late show and every single news show and opinion show to give us their take on, right? You know, if if a guy wants to go pee in the girl's bathroom, that's national news. We need to change federal law so that that could be something that happens. But this is something that just kind of goes by the wayside. So in terms of the main focus of the report, it's looking at the situation in 13 countries. The previous report looked at 20 different countries, but this one is focusing in on 13 countries. And those countries are China, North Korea, Egypt, Pakistan, Eritrea, Saudi Arabia, India, Sudan, Iran, Syria, Iraq, Turkey, and Nigeria. So one thing that you'll notice about all those countries is they're either Muslim majority countries or communist countries. That that's so that'll be something to grow on. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But some of the things that frequently are seen in these countries and obviously show up in this report, um, we see the murder, genocide, assault, rape, kidnapping, unlawful detention, unfair trial, prevention of religious assembly and peaceful religious expression of Christians. So in a lot of these countries, they don't really have the same standards or actions towards other faiths. It, it's really centered around and mainly about Christianity. Now, there are examples in some of those countries listed where it's of religions of any kind that they're cracking down on, especially like China. You hear that they've cracked down on Muslims and they sent them to like uh, Muslim uh, I, I don't know, it's like reintegration camps or, or rewording or rethinking camps. I can't remember exactly what it's called. So we do see that quite a bit. I did want to read a, a quick excerpt from the report. It's it's from the beginning, just to kind of give you an idea of the scale here, because it's it's almost impossible to really know the scale of persecution around the globe. This organization is probably one of, if not the best organization at doing that. But I'm going to read an excerpt here for you. In April of 2017, the Pew Research Center released a report showing that the number of countries where Christians fell victim to government restriction and social hostilities grew from 108 in 2014 to 128 the following year. In its World Watch Monitor report covering 2016, Open Doors, an organization supporting persecution or persecuted Christians, rather, found that more than 200 million Christians in the 50 countries where it is most difficult to be a Christian experience persecution because of their faith. 
Other sources claim that the true figure for 2016 may be as high as 600 million. Although the precise number of Christians persecuted for their faith remains unclear, reports showing a fall in the number of deaths during the period under review to below 100,000 nevertheless highlight that the violence against followers of Jesus Christ remains severe. So this is something that, uh, again, like I said, it, it's really difficult to really peg um, to peg these things. But, uh, you know, it's one of those things that we, we need to look at as thinking Christians and think, how should we respond to these things? So one thing I want to do here is I want you guys to be able to read the report on your own. Obviously, you saw that coming, but I do want to highlight some different sections of the report. So this report is obviously done really well. There's the full report, which I'll, I'll give you a link to, but there's also a report to the executive summary. And so I want to read some excerpts from the executive summary. And so the first section I want to go through is one called the imminent threat of wipeout. So I'm going to read this part to you here. The most significant factor in this context is undoubtedly the enforced exodus of Christians. In Syria, the decimation of the church community was profound. While figures for the country as a whole are disputed, it is notable that by March 2016, Chaldean Bishop Antoine Udu of Aleppo was claiming that Syria's Christians now numbered 500,000, a fall of 1.2 million, or two-thirds within five years. The decline was especially marked in certain towns and cities for which more specific data has been collected. Syria's second city of Aleppo, until 2011, home to the country's largest Christian community of 150,000, saw an exodus of faithful, with numbers dropping to barely 35,000 by spring of 2017, a fall of more than 75%. While the exodus was undoubtedly driven by an ongoing civil war, that part played by, the part played by specific targeting of Christians should not be underestimated. This would help explain the disproportionate decline in their number as compared to the overall population, which in the case of Aleppo had fallen by perhaps 25% in the same period. In Iraq, meanwhile, figures for the Christian population showed a decline from 270,000 to 275,000 in mid-2015 to below 200,000 two years later, and possibly as few as 150,000. If this decline were to continue at the same rate, it would show that the 2015 persecuted and forgotten report prediction of a virtual wipeout of Iraq's Christian community by 2020 remains on track. However, fears that Christians in Iraq are, quote, on the verge of extinction, unquote, were to some extent alleviated at the end of the reporting period by news of thousands of families returning to their homes on the Nineveh plains following the defeat of ISIS. So this is something really important uh, at the end of this, where it's basically talking about the defeat of I ISIS. This is why it's important to have strong leadership. Okay. Need I remind you, I had two opportunities to vote for Donald Trump and I chose not to both times. So don't think I'm one of those guys that's just a slobbering MAGA MAGA, you know, always Trumper. I'm also not a never Trumper. He is my president. I want him to do well, just like I wanted Barack Obama to do well. But Barack Obama was a paper tiger when it came to international uh, extremism or fundamentalism or any of those things. Like he basically could have crushed ISIS like with a few bombs or a few dozen soldiers whenever they were just a little group of guys out in the middle of the desert, but he chose not to. He very infamously called them the JV team, right? So say what you will about Trump. And I've said plenty, but this is a man who basically said, Oh, uh, general Mattis, these ISIS guys, you know, the, these little pests, let's go ahead and wipe them off the face of the planet. And we pretty much did that. And we pretty much gave huge swaths of Iraq and Syria back to its people. So moving on to the next section, which is called genocide of Christians. I'm going to read a section from this part here. Taken as a whole, this evidence proves conclusively that Christians in Syria and Iraq have fallen victim to genocide as defined by the convention on the prevention of punishment of the crime of genocide as adopted by the United Nations. The evidence is consistent with an intent to destroy in whole or in part the Christian community and meets all the indicators set out by the convention, any one of which is sufficient to be proof of genocide, including A, killing members of the group, B, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, and C, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Evidence also shows that ISIS activity to be consistent with the final two sets of genocide, final two tests of genocide set down by the convention concerning efforts to prevent births and transferring children away. In November 2016, French Catholic priest Father Patrick Dubois 
described his experiences helping Christian families in Iraq and Syria, saying, they dislocate the families, they take the newborn babies, and they put them in Islamist families. Families, Adding that the young children are trained to be terrorists. He said that young girls who are virgins are selected by doctors and sold. Genocide against Christians has taken place in northern Nigeria, where Boko Haram, an affiliate of ISIS, set about a campaign of violence to ensure the faithful will not be able to stay. Islamist Fulani herdsmen, accused of colluding with sister organization Boko Haram, carried out a campaign of butchery, desecration of church buildings, rape, and mass expulsion of Christians. When an aide to the Church in Need delegation visited northern Nigeria in March of 2017, church leaders handed them a dossier showing that in one diocese alone, Kafanchen, within five years, 988 people had been killed and 71 Christian-majority villages had been destroyed, as well as 2,712 homes and 20 churches. In Madaguri, formerly a Boko Haram heartland, the diocesan officials reported that 1.8 million people had been displaced, 5 million women had been become widows, and 15,000 children were now orphans. Damage had been done to 200 churches and chapels, as well as 35 presbyteries and ch- parish centers. So, obviously, um, genocide is a real thing, and it's really happening, and it's so hard to talk about, and so hard to even think about, because we, we think in terms of modern standards, and we think that this is something that, that should have happened back in the day like this isn't something that could happen now are we really seeing a genocide of, of any particular group of people and again we we kind of get whitewashed to this uh, being in america we just don't really think about these things but but it's incredible that we have brothers and sisters that are going through that now moving on to the next section i want to read a little excerpt from government week on extremism it's the next section here so let me go into a little short paragraph here in countries such as sudan the islamist threat was mainly from the government which human rights observers accused of causing religious freedom to spiral downwards. In the 2015 to 2017 period, Sudan's president, Omar al-Bashir, pursued a hardline Islamist agenda, deeply hostile to Christians, resulting in churches being torn down each month, Christians being arrested for alleged proselytizing, and women being fined for wearing obscene and modest dress. When the government removed the citizenship rights of people with origins outside the country, it sparked a massive exodus of Christians who were forced to go to their ancestral homelands in neighboring South Sudan, in spite of having lived in Sudan itself for 300 or for 30 years or more. And so th- this was something where it's like uh, we have these governments where, that are supposed to be protecting the people. Again, we think in terms of things in the West and w- we see that, you know, we're supposed to protect the people, create laws that will allow people to to have the freedom to do things. But most countries around the world don't have the foggiest idea about what liberty is. They certainly don't have freedom to do different things and move around. It's just not something that they're big on. So I want to move to the next section here, which is religious nationalism in the targeting of Christians. So I'm going to read a little bit from here. Since the right wing Bharatiya, I hope I'm saying that right, Bharatiya Janata Party or BJP came to power in April, May of 2014's general election, Christians in India have faced increasing intolerance and violence. The PJP's espousal of Hindutva philosophy has been a crucial factor in this situation. Hindutva, a right-wing form of Hindu nationalism, sees India as a Hindu country which should not tolerate other religions or cultures. Much of the anti-Christian rhetoric of Hindutva groups and hinges on the suggestion that Christians are responsible for forced conversions. Archbishop Leo Cornelio of Bhopal claimed that such allegations were designed to sow division between faith communities, adding, I want to ask those who accuse us of converting gullible people to Christianity, where are those whom we converted? Nindutva groups have held Gar Wapsi homecoming ceremonies and reports suggest, ironically, given their rhetoric against forced conversions, that many of these events have involved the forcible reconversions of Christians to Hinduism. And so uh, th- this is something that's in- incredibly crazy. And I have to just take a little pause here because I just want to you know, prepare you for what I'm about to read here in just a second. So a report by Catholic Secular Forum recorded 365 serious anti-Christian atrocities in India in 2016, including 10 people being killed and more than 500 members of the clergy or senior faith members being attacked for their faith. For example, in July of 2016, a 14-year-old Christian schoolgirl in Chahatsgarth state was gang-raped and killed following her family's refusal to renounce their faith. 
2017 has seen a sharp rise in incidents. The data available at the time of writing this report, which was covering January to May of 2017, showed that there were 316 incidents, almost as many as were recorded for the whole of 2016. So guys, I know for a lot of you, India doesn't really come to mind as this hotbed of Christian persecution. But I mean, just think about that. There was a schoolgirl that was raped because her, her parents, her family wouldn't convert back to Hinduism. Again, we're, we're supposed to look at things like Hinduism as, oh, well, you know, that's just an Eastern religion. They have all these thousands and thousands of gods. They're pretty much harmless. There's a lot of groups that aren't harmless, guys, and we need to wake up. The next section I want to read a little bit from is communism's worsening clampdown on Christianity. So obviously this is going to be talking about China and North Korea. So here we go. Christians in communist countries, China and North Korea, continue to experience persecution and discrimination in various forms. North Korea's Songbun social stratification system determines access to necessities such as food, education, and healthcare based on people's position in one of the 51 potential categories, which signify greater or lesser loyalty to the regime. Those in lower categories are classified as hostile to the state. Protestants rank at 37, Catholics at 39. This system enshrines discrimination based on religious belief in the very structure of communist society, making it all the more worrying that in 2016, China announced plans to implement a similar system. Citizens would be assigned a category based on their political, commercial, social, and legal credit. While details remain vague, it seems probable that the system would assign a lower rating to Christians. This would appear likely, especially given that government efforts to increase control of the church gained fresh impetus in in April of 2016 following the programmatic speech by President Xi Jinping at the National Conference on the regime's approach to religion. Part of the narrative presented by President Xi Jinping is that Christianity is a means of foreign infiltration into China. Recognizing the influence of religious practice on society, he insisted on the need to sinicize religious life, i.e. make it authentically Chinese for one for which one can read communists and automatize it, i.e. free it from foreign control. This has been reflected in the government response to religious groups that operate outside of state control, the so-called underground churches. So obviously, guys, I know a lot of you have heard a lot about uh, the situation going on in North Korea and in China. And uh, I mean, really, guys, it, it just doesn't get a whole lot worse than that whenever you combine the godlessness of communism with, you know, a regime that's willing to basically to carry that forward a little bit lower in that section or uh, later in that section. I want to read a little bit here, a little bit more about North Korea. Otto Warmbier's return to the U.S. in a state of unresponsive wakefulness and subsequent death also draws attention to the extreme conditions endured in North Korea's prison camps. Reports describe Christians undergoing unspeakable atrocities in the camps, often being singled out for worse treatment because they are religious prisoners, including forced labor, torture, persecution, starvation, rape, forced abortion, sexual violence, and extrajudicial killings. According to CSW, Christians have also been hung on a cross over a fire, crushed under a steamroller, and herded off bridges. One estimate suggests that three quarters of Christians in the camps die from the harsh punishments they receive. So guys, this is a modern description of a country that exists in 2018. Being hung from a cross over fire, crushed by a steamroller, and basically thrown off bridges. This is happening. Like this, this stuff is happening. I mean, this is just crazy. I mean, I'm like reading, I'm like, this can't, this can't be real. Like, is this some sort of like fiction that I'm, that I'm missing somewhere, but it's absolutely real. Now towards the conclusion here, uh, I want to just read a little bit from the, the, the final area. It's called conclusion. It's now or never to save Christians from persecution. One quick paragraph here. At a time in the West when there is increasing media focus on the rights of people regardless of gender, ethnicity, or sexuality, to name but a few, it is ironic that in many sections of the media there should be such limited coverage of the massive persecution experienced by so many Christians. The worsening plight of Christians in a country such as Eritrea, little known to the West and hitherto largely ignored by the media, is a case in point. Highlighting the scale of Christian oppression against a background of media ambivalence towards the subject forms the impetus behind this, the 2017 edition of ACN's Persecuted and Forgotten Report.
It shows that not only is Christianity still the world's most oppressed faith community, but also that in many cases, genocide and other crimes against humanity now mean that the church in core countries and regions faces the possibility of imminent wipeout. So guys, I think that's a, a tremendous point to bring up here towards the conclusion, which is look at the things we we complain about and talk about in the West. I mean, I mean, every, right now, the sexual revolution, everything about LGBTQ plus APP, TTTYL, AARP, whatever the, whatever the thing is, it just keeps it being added to. Those are like major things that people worry about, right? And I'm not trying to diminish the people that struggle with those things, but we can't even categorize it as what they are. Like a lot of the things discussed in there are, are mental disorders. So someone that is born a man and thinks he's a woman, that is a mental disorder, right? It's gender dysphoria. They, they, they need treatment for that, but we can't possibly say something like that, right? It's just crazy for, for someone to think that, right? I mean, just think about it. Think about how, how, how we take if someone who's born white thinks or, or says that, no, actually I'm Mexican or actually I'm black or actually, or something like that. Think about how crazy that would be. Like at that point, we're going to look at science and be like, yeah, that, that's absurd. It doesn't matter if you identify as somebody from a different ethnicity, it may, you are still what you are. But, but the guys, this report is so important for us. And I was just thinking through this because I read this a while ago. I knew about it at the beginning of the year, but it just came back up in conversation here recently. That's why I wanted to share it with you. But there's a few things I was, I was thinking about as to why this report is so important, why a report like this would be so important. And the first thing is we're in America and, and this stuff just seems so far away. That's the first thing is why a report like this is good for us Westerners to see. Because if you're a blue tie person, you're like, you've just been in, in sheer hell for the last two years because Donald Trump's been the president. And if you're a red tie person, you were in hell for the last eight years before that because Barack Obama was president. And you just look at the things that we complain about in the 24 hour news cycle. And it's, it's just fresh outrage every day. There's never like a normal day where like, there's no natural disasters. You know, nobody in Congress says anything stupid. Like nobody gets shot. Like we don't ever have times like that, right? It's just constant. Every single day, there's something going on every now and then the news takes a weekend off. Right. But in America, we just, we don't think about things like this. And we don't think about what happens in all these other countries because they're an ocean away, right? Thousands and thousands of miles away, right? It's just kind of out of sight, out of mind, right? The second thing why I feel like this report is so important is that it reminds us what it was like for early Christians. I mean, really, like the first, second, and third century Christians, I mean, there was no such thing as solo scriptura in those times, if, if you really think about it, because the Bible didn't come until like the fourth century. And so people that were dying, especially in the first century, they weren't dying because of what they believed. They were dying because of what they saw. It's reported, it was reported in the Bible that oh, 500 people saw a resurrected Jesus, right? 500 people. And a lot of those people died martyrs' deaths. And their family members died martyrs' deaths. And as Christianity spread around the Mediterranean Rim, there were so many people that died martyrs' deaths, but you would be hard-pressed to find, if you could even find it, a, a resource where you see someone saying, no, 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 uh, I'm just kidding. I'm not a Jesus follower. If As they're being marched into the middle of the Colosseum to, to fight armed gladiators without arms themselves, right? Or, you know, basically swords and stuff like that. Or, you know, or they're going somewhere where they're about to be killed by an animal. They just don't know which animal it's going to be that day. Are they going to be trampled by an elephant or have their throat ripped out by a lion? Like they, they just didn't know exactly what it was. But uh, I think I talked about this last year on my uh, best books of 2017 podcast. I think it was episode uh, two or three of this podcast. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Talked about this book called Tried by Fire by William Bennett. And it talked about, that was a book about the first thousand years of, of church history. And it's basically just martyrdom. That's what the first thousand years of Christianity was. It was just people dying because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And what's happening right now in these countries that we've talked about, that's what was happening back then. And it's crazy when you, when you read back about what was happening at those times, it's like, man, what, what kind of humanity was happening at that time? Like, yeah, we know they didn't have iPhones and electricity and running water in a lot of these places, but gosh dang, like what, how in the world could, could, could humanity be worse? That stuff is still happening. It's just crazy that something like that could still go on. And another thing I want to talk about here in terms of why this report is important is because it reminds us what Islam actually is. Because aside from North Korea and China, 
uh, most of the countries I talked about are Muslim majority countries. And I guess you could include India in there as well, because that's, I believe, a, a mainly Hindu country. But all these other countries are Muslim majority countries. And these are countries where they take the Quran seriously, where they take what's lined out in Surah 9 of the Quran seriously. Because there's, there's a concept of abrogation that people don't really understand. All the peaceful verses that people quote about the Quran, it, whether you're a Muslim apologist or maybe a member of the left-wing media trying to make it seem like, oh, it's not that big a deal when Muslims chop people's heads off and roll it down the street as they're screaming, Allahu Akbar. Um, these are individuals that are not Muslim extremists. That's actually a misnomer. These are Muslim fundamentalists. These people are actually sticking to what the Quran says at an extreme level. And that's the scary part. The scary part is if there were droves of Muslims that are more conservative, if they were to wake up and understand what abrogation is, I know I mentioned it earlier and didn't explain it. Abrogation is basically where there are parts of the Quran that are peaceful, that have peaceful notions in there that Muhammad later said, oh, those things don't apply anymore. This is what my revelation from God is now. And the latest parts of the, of the Quran, the parts that were towards the, the latter parts of Muhammad's life, all of those things are violent and bloody. There's no peace. There's no, oh, let's just uh, kind of see if we can coexist with the Christians or the Jews or anything like that. There was none of that. None of that at all. And so I think this is just a good reminder. And if you think I'm making this stuff up, there, there's plenty of resources. Nabil Qureshi wrote two great books, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, and No God But One, or Law or Jesus. And I think those are two great breakdowns. This was a guy who went from, um, I think it was, he was a Salafi Muslim, and then he ended up becoming a Christian and kind of goes through his journey. But th the, that's the scariest part about Islam is it's so specific what they're called to do. And the crazy part is, is Boko Haram and Al Qaeda and uh, ISIS and those types of organizations, the Taliban, the Muslim Brotherhood, those are the ones that are actually following it to a T. And the last part here um, that I think is really important about this report is it reminds us why things like the prosperity gospel are bogus like and just nonsense. I mean, this idea that Christianity makes things better for you is ridiculous. And, and let me let me just explain that. Uh, Andy Stanley, who I like a lot, and I've been following for a long time, read his stuff, listened to his sermons, all that. He ha he's, has this, this saying that he says that I've never really understood, but he says, you know, following Jesus will make life better and make you better at life. It's, it's a very bumper sticker, coffee cup quote. But the thing about it is, is where do you get that idea? I mean, following Jesus ultimately means the end is good for you. Right, the whole heaven thing is really, really important. But if you're thinking about the earth that we live on and the life that we have to live on that earth, it's pretty it's pretty insane. Like to say something like that. Like, where do what hint do we get from the New Testament that things work out great for Christians? I mean, didn't pretty much all the apostles die a martyr's death except John? I mean, John, they tried to give him mart martyr's death. They tried to kill him by like putting him in boiling oil or something like that. And then they basically excommunicated him to Patmos. So he didn't exactly have a relaxing into his life. I mean, th this idea that Christianity is just supposed to be this soft thing and we just follow Jesus and dollar bills just rain down from the sky. It's just, it's ridiculous. It's nonsense. And the reality is, is we as Christians, you know, I'm here in Oklahoma. There's, there's no threat of when I walk into a church that we're going to have some sort of an issue that the state or federal government's going to come in and shut us down, or we're going to have to go underground, even in highly, highly liberal places in the United States, mainly on the coast, the coasts, you're not having to worry about that. I mean, maybe people are sneering at you and turning their nose up at you like, oh, these Christians, these theists, like what's wrong with these people? So whatever they say, right? They're just making crap up. That's still not that bad. I talk about this all the time. People think they're being persecuted if someone says something mean to them online about being a Christian, like makes fun of them a little bit or says, oh, you believe in the spaghetti monster in the sky? What a moron. Like they think that's persecution. They think that's their cross to bear. It's just hilarious. It's just absolutely, absolutely hilarious. But it's things like this that help us realize what's going on for our brothers and sisters overseas. I mean, there are legitimately people dying for their faith. They're having guns put in their face. They're, they're having knives at their throats and they're being asked, are you going to renounce faith in Jesus Christ? 
Are you going to become a Muslim? Are you going to become a Hindu? Are you going to be uh, become an atheist? Are you going to denounce it? And these people are unequivocally saying, no, I'm not going to denounce my God, my Jesus. And then they get their throats cut. Then they get ran over by a steamroller. Then they get, you know, buried alive, drowned alive, you know, just all, the, all that kind of stuff. And so, again, it's important for us to think through that. To, to be thinking Christians, to support organizations that are giving aid to these individuals, but also just prayer. Prayer for these people. I know people are like, oh yeah, I'm sending thoughts and prayers. Uh, like they make fun of that. But no, it's really important because we need to pray for these people. Because when they die, it's, it's a horrible thing. And there's always a ripple effect of negativity after that. And uh, it's just important for us to continue to look at things like this. I know a lot of Christians that I see, uh, you know, men and women, they, they don't want to read through reports like this. They don't want to see stuff like this. It's just too much. It's just a little bit too violent. It's just a little bit too real. We, we don't need to turn away from these things. We need to look right at them. We need to look right at them and think to ourselves, you know, wh- how would I react in this situation? Do I have faith? Do I have spiritual resilience in the face of things like this? And how would I react? I think that's good for us. All right, guys, before we let you out of here, we're going to do a quick resilience boost. As you know, by now, we are a men's ministry and our mission is cultivating manly resilience. Specifically, we do that by providing content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical toughness. Today, we're focusing on spiritual resilience. So the big thing for you guys is I want to make sure you see the resources that I was reading from. So I'm going to provide you a link to the aid to the church in need page. And there's three different things on that page. The first thing is a country profile. So, um, all the different countries, the 13 countries, they all have their own individual profiles. And so there's these highlights of kind of what was happening in these countries and the statistics therein. And so that's something that I want to provide to you there. The second link is actually the report. So this is the executive summary that I was reading the quotes from. Um, and so that's a very important report. It's about like 26 or 27 pages, something like that, but it's not all typed. There's a pictures and different things like that. So I want you to be able to see that. Also, there's something called the faces of persecution. So there's individual stories. It kind of brings it more down to a ground level point of view about what's happening uh, with some of these people, some of the murders that have happened, some of the desecrations of churches, the defiling of bodies. And so I want you to be able to read through that. And then also I provided an Amazon link to that book that I talk, talked about earlier. So that was the tried by fire, the story of Christianity's first thousand years by William J. Bennett. Um, It is a fairly uh, lengthy book, but it's a very important book for you to read. Again, this is the second time I've talked about it on this podcast, so I just want to make sure that you guys know that that is out there. It's an incredibly interesting read, and it'll give you more perspective about what our Christian forefathers had to go through. Thank you guys, as always, for listening to the podcast. Please subscribe on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Google Play and refer your friends to listen. If you share this on social media, make sure you use the hashtag Undaunted Life. We'll be sure to find that post and give it a thumbs up if you do so. If we deserve a five-star review, guys, please leave us a five-star review. We're currently still five-star rated, but when you leave us a review, leave us one to two sentences, maybe three or four sentences, something like that to let us know why you like the content so we can keep putting it out for you. All right, I'm currently booking speaking engagements for the remainder of 2018 and the beginning of 2019, so if you want me to come to speak to your church, to your men's group, to your event, just let me know. Hit me up at info at undaunted.life, info at undaunted.life. The website is www.undaunted.life, and you can follow Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Undaunted Life or Facebook.com backslash Undaunted Life. Check out our free devotionals on the YouVersion Bible app. Just search Undaunted Life under plans. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their music library for our content. The intro outro track on this podcast is their song King of Sorrow, which is off their latest record entitled Phantom Anthem. The links to all of this are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep cultivating manly resilience, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical toughness. Keep seeking the Lion of Judah.